Just to make the point, PayPal say they do not comment on individual cases. Now, enough of that. It's time for the first drink of the day. It's Talking Pints. David Diddy Hamilton. <laughs> Welcome to Talking Pints. Thank Great you very much to see indeed. You. Now, before we do anything, yeah. I always thought you were called Diddy Hamilton because you, you were on the shorter side, but there's actually a much better story here. Well, there? actually, it was working with Ken Dodd on a series for um, ITV called Doddy's Music Box back in the swinging 60s. And it was a show that featured some of the pop stars of the day, people like Dusty Springfield, Matt Munro, Billy Fury, um, dotted between which was um, sketches with uh, a, a repertory of actors. And I was the, the interviewer, the straight man, if you like. And during rehearsal, was for the first time I met Ken on the set and he realised that he was a few inches taller than yep. me and he saw me as his latest Diddy man. So during, <laughs> during rehearsals he called me Diddy David. Yep. And the people who were in the studio, the makeup artists, the props boys, the cameramen, all chuckled to see their an announcer, because I was an announcer at the time, being debunked in this way. And in fairness to him, he took me to one side afterwards and he said, do you mind me calling you that? He said, because if you do, I won't do it anymore. Uh, and he said, if you don't mind, I think it'll stick. So I said, I don't mind. And I've been stuck with it now for 55 years. Doddy made you diddy. <laughs> and yes, that's what everyone knows you are. Now, a remarkable <laughs> career. I mean, you start off with British forces broadcasting radio during national service. And here we are, 63 years later, and yeah. you're on Boom Radio, which I understand is going quite well. Yeah. And in the intervening years, you've done television, you've done radio you've done top of the pot i will come to all of that but what really interests me david is actually you know you've got a phd in organic chemistry i mean you're a scientist you're a man whose career was going to be devoted to looking at curing diseases and all the rest of it what happened well, uh, as you mentioned, I was called up for my national service yes. in the RAF. I had been working as a, a scriptwriter at ATV, and I was posted to Germany. And um, the local radio station there was the uh, Cologne end of Two Way Family Favourites, which was the big record show at the time. So I went to see the boss there. I'd only been in Germany for a couple of days, and I went to the studio in Cologne. And I said, look, I'm a writer. Can, can you use me at your station? So he said, well, we don't actually employ writers writers, but we do need somebody to read the football results. So that was the first thing I did. And I knew it was all about inflection. You know, yeah. Crystal Palace 1, Fulham 2. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, Nigel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> it's all right, I got it. Oh, we're going to come back to Fulham, that's don't in, worry. That's in dreamland. But, but I mean, you could have been, you know, you could have spent this career, you know, as a scientist, as a medical researcher. And you Where just, have you got that from? Yeah, well, that's what I've been told. Is it, is it wrong? <laughs> yes. Is it? Well, I was are. never academic. No? in any way at no, all. really? I, well, my father was a journalist, and yep. you know, we're a writing family, so I was a scriptwriter. And um, I would still have been a scriptwriter had I not got mm. to uh, Germany. But I must tell you that after a few days of reading the football results, I said to the boss of the station one day, I said, this music that you play, I said, Peggy Lee and Bing Crosby, yeah. it's fine for the officers, but the troops want rock and roll. So he said to me, how do you know? And I said, because I am a troop. So I don't think he knew what rock and roll so was. So rock and roll was brand new. It was brand new. Yeah, it was yeah, 1959. Yeah. yeah. So he said, I'll tell you what, I'll give you a show on Sunday afternoon and we'll see how it goes. So I played the music of Little Richard, Jerry Lee Lewis, Elvis Presley, who was in Germany at the same time doing his national service yeah. with the US Army. It's quite revolutionary stuff at the time. Yeah. I think Elvis was in Frankfurt and I was in Cologne, so I didn't meet him. And the troops absolutely loved it. One of the first radio shows to play rock and roll. And because the boss was very embarrassed about radiating rock and roll to the troops, he followed the show with a speech by the Padre. So the Padre <laughs> came on and cleansed their sins for listening to this pagan music. <laughs> and you go on and you're there at the because the birth of Radio 1. I mean, when people like yes. Tony, Tony Blackburn, who've been out stuck in the North Sea, and, yeah. and they're back and Radio 1 gets launched. And a very, quite well, an exciting moment, I'd have thought that Very was. much so, because uh, at that time, it was really the only radio station, apart from Radio Luxembourg at night. So the audiences were enormous, so something like about 15 million. And in the yeah. mid-70s, my show was on Radio 1 and Radio 2. The BBC had one of their periodical cuts, and mm. I was on both stations at the same time. It's sort of kind of hybrid program. 
program. But um, it was a fantastic. I mean, DJs at that time were, you know, really as well known as the stars. Oh. Absolutely. His music Absolutely. Well, Tony Blackburn's still doing it too, isn't he? He did. He did. Sounds of the you, 60s. You know, you promised you wouldn't use bad language. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't promise me that. <laughs> what, makes a good, what makes a good DJ? What makes a good TV presenter? Well, it's very hard to say that. Um, what makes a good DJ? I think, as with television, you have to remember that particularly with radio, you're talking to one person. You're not talking to yeah. a group of people. It's very different from stage appearances. So if you have one, per I think of a friend. It could be male, it could be female. But yeah. I think of somebody, if they're listening to my show, then in some way they must like me. And I think you've got to try and be a little bit different from anybody else. When I started out, my broadcasting hero was Pete Murray. Mm -hmm. And I listened to Pete on Radio Luxembourg. And Pete, by the way, uh, last weekend was nine. 97. Wow. And it's still going. And he's going to do a, a program for us on Boom at, at Christmas time. Oh, fantastic. That so, no, I mean, listen, good for you. And I'm, I'm, I'm very excited that Boom is doing as well as it is. It is. Oh, I mean, Top of the Pops, that must have been just huge yes. in its day. Well, uh, once again, you know, Top of the Pops had huge audiences, but yeah. the BBC in those days were very, very careful with their money. And the most that I ever got for hosting Top of the Pops, remember, this is a national peak time show, yeah. 15 million viewers maybe, 90 quid. Yeah. And afterwards, I used to do a disco in a pub in the old Kent Road. <laughs> and I get, about, I get about three times as much money for working to 200 people. And I used to think, how, how can this be right? But of course, Top of the Pops and Radio One gave you the shop window. But yeah. in those days, to earn you know, fairly decent money. We had to travel yeah. the country doing the clubs. Yeah, yeah. Or speaking engagements or whatever. Yes. I mean, David, 63 years you've been doing this, 63 years, you show almost no signs of wanting to slow up in any way at all. No. You're still no. busy as hell. Do you still enjoy it the way you used to? I, I love it. I really love my work. I mean, why would I retire? I think you only retire from something that you don't enjoy. But a job that, I mean, I love to go to work. I mean, I'm actually broadcasting from home now. We started during yeah. lockdown and we're all broadcasting from home. I think a lot of people are getting an idea now. They don't need, particularly with radio, don't need studios anymore. You can do it from your attic or your, your shed in the garden. But so, I, you know, I don't have any traveling. But um, I, I remember a quote of George, the great George Burns, who, you know, worked mm. well into his 90s. And he said he said uh, when he was 90 odd, getting on for 100, he said, you can't die when you've got another booking. Yeah. And I've got yeah. plenty of bookings. Yeah. He also <laughs> said on his 100th birthday, didn't he? If I'd known I was going to live this long, I'd, I'd have looked after myself <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> with a big cigar and all the rest those, of it. Those quotes of those old pros are just wonderful, aren't they? I mean, I, I love them. And of course, I work with Doddy. I work with Tommy Cooper and oh. Benny, Benny Hill as well. So I, I had the privilege of, of working with, the, with the, some of the great comedians. You know, I remember a sketch I did with Benny Hill. You would love this. It was a male beauty contest. I was the compare <laughs> with you know, Dickie Bow and, uh, and, the, and the smart whistle. And uh, he came on in lycra shorts. And he gave me a wonderful line. And I introduced him and I said, please welcome our first contestant. And Ivor Biggin from Mill Hill. <laughs> and Benny came out and he said, No, I'm Ivor Mill from Biggin Hill. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, you were involved in all of that. And Tommy Cooper, well, what a, I mean, that must have been a real honour to work with him. Tommy Cooper, yeah. I mean, uh, there were some great stories about Tommy. You know, like a lot of comedians, uh, he was a little bit tight. You know, they, they're all a little bit careful with their money. And apparently, whenever he uh, took a taxi, he would say to the, the, the cabbie at the end of the drive, have a drink on me, give him a tea bag. <laughs> so you can imagine when he got, never guess who I had in my cab today. <laughs> Tommy, Tommy, did he give you a tip? Yes, love. <laughs> <laughs> David, I mean, and Fulham FC, a big, big passion. We sort of teased yes. it earlier, didn't we? Yes, Fulham FC. And, um, you, and you've been there as an announcer. I was, right? a, I was a Fulham supporter from the, the age of about eight. And then I was a director of the club in the 70s. And then during the Mohammed Al Fayed, uh, era with your friend Michael Cole, who's yeah. been on the show yeah, a lot. Yeah. He was he was there. Uh, he was, I think, the uh, Mohammed Al Fayed's PR man mm, at was. that time. I was the match day, what was called the match day MC for eighteen seasons, mm. during which 
Uh, we had three promotions. We had a European final in Hamburg where I got stuck on a cherry picker. They put me up on a cherry picker <laughs> uh, in front of the Fulham fans behind the goal. And it was very nearly kickoff time. And the thing shuddered and it wouldn't go down. And I don't like heights. And I thought... I'm up here for the night. You know, it was a, it was a nasty moment. <laughs> but Fulham have very kindly, they do a thing called uh, Forever Fulham, where uh, at halftime they get ex-players come on the pitch and they give them a special award. And once a year they do it for non-players. And uh, in a couple of weeks' time, uh, they're giving me the... Um, Fulham Forever Award Fantastic. on the pitch. So I'm really... Fantastic. It's the Bournemouth game. Fantastic. I'm looking forward to that. Yeah. Now, you've had a medical diagnosis recently, but as yes. with everything you do, you're just carrying on. Well, this is why I'm drinking water today. Yeah. I just had a routine blood test, and uh, they told me that I had a blood condition called uh, PV. That's the abbreviation yeah. of it. And basically, uh, it's I've got too many red blood cells. Mm. The problem is, Nigel, I'm too red-blooded. <laughs> I've known this for a long time. He's used that line before. <laughs> <laughs> it's been confirmed by the medics. Uh, anyway, I'm, I've got to say that the NHS have been fantastic. Good. I was rushed into a uh, hospital in Guildford. Yep. Um, and uh, um, they, they're all on the HS. They, they've been NHS. They've been absolutely terrific. And what they do is they take blood from you and they take a pint of blood from, from your arm. The only problem is that my veins disappeared many years ago and they've had trouble taking blood. So I said to them, I said, the problem is you can't get blood out of the stone. <laughs> I said, ask my wife and she'll tell you. <laughs> but anyway, what they do now is to save doing that. And I came out there with like a sort of, you know, all these, these like a hedgehog yeah. with all these pricks in me. Um, pardon the expression. That's all right. We'll, we'll, we'll live with it. <laughs> yeah. I, um, what they do now is they put me on chemo. So I take yeah. chemo pills. And uh, the only side effect I found is that I do get a little bit bit tired but apart from that well i've been fine and i drink a lot of water yeah so well I, I, diddy hamilton cheers. it's an absolute pleasure mm. to have you on talking pints fantastic thank you. career you've thank pretty, you very much you've clearly loved every minute of it you're yeah. clearly still loving it you brought great entertainment to huge numbers of people i thank you for coming the first on. 60 years are the hardest okay i'll remember that that's it from me